Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katua. Kosamanth Bares Takuingwa, Kotakumahi Kitamana Tatai, Hoko Hoko, Kotamana Fakahire, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Many thanks indeed for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, the relationship between the FMA and the FSC has been very strong over many years, and ensuring this continues is really important to me, the FMA board, and everyone at the FMA. This year's conference theme is Consumer Resilience and Prosperity. Maintaining resilience through these times, whilst also taking long-term decisions to secure the future prosperity, is essential for the financial well-being of all New Zealanders. Consumer resilience and prosperity is an important theme for the FMA and for me. This is because once responsibility for credit regulation, the triple CFA, is transferred to us, we will have a role in overseeing the financial products that touch most New Zealanders' lives. Whether it's securing a loan for a car, getting professional uh, financial advice, buying your first home and insuring it, insuring yourself and your livelihood, or saving and investing for your retirement and other financial goals. The FMA will have a key role in making sure New Zealanders have trust and confidence in the financial services sector. I want to pick up on regulatory burden. It's a, it's a, it's a big topic at the moment. And during a period of regulatory change, it's important that the FMA's regulatory approach is clear and understood. And I want to take a moment to step back and explain my personal philosophy of regulation, which is such a great match with the FMA and, and a really big reason why uh, I took the role um, when I was offered it three years ago now. So, this year, 2024, marks the 40th anniversary of the fourth Labour government and a significant period of economic and regulatory reform. I grew up in the 80s in Christchurch. For me, regulation was deeply discredited. I associated it with driving an over-controlled economy, including poor services, such as three months to get a phone line fitted, and unrealistic controls on prices, the New Zealand dollar, rents and interest rates, to name a few, including seeing people homeless because of the rent controls. I was an idealistic economic student and a huge supporter of the role of markets to drive growth and prosperity. I was skeptical about regulation and felt we always needed to be clear that regulation is a necessary intervention to support growth and long-term prospects of New Zealanders. It became so much of a driving passion for me that 40 years later, here I am talking to you as the chief executive of a regulator. Not many people grow up wanting to be a regulator, <laughs> but there you go. The FMI, FMA and I are incredibly focused on regulation that genuinely matters and delivers for New Zealanders. The underlying philosophy remains, we simply cannot regulate for the sake of regulating. Regulation needs to pass the so what test, as well as enabling innovation. So by keeping an eye on unnecessary regulatory burden, we can ensure that our regulatory approach is achieving the outcomes that we and New Zealanders expect. It's why, for example, we have provided the government with a list of proposals where both our time and yours can be used more valuably, valuably while still ensuring consumers and investors are protected. We've also valued you proactively highlighting to us further changes that the FMA and the Minister should consider. We are further demonstrating this as we consider a class exemption for bonds which offer investors additional non-financial benefit, green, social sustainability, sustainability-linked bonds, etc. The sector has told us that there should be a more efficient route to market for these bonds. This has the potential to avoid unnecessary compliance costs, as well as incentivize the development of this market. When we hear fair arguments like these, we are prepared to reflect on them and consider changes accordingly. So 
I want to pick up on guidance. Guidance from the FMA can be an efficient approach to supporting the sector meet regulatory expectations as the New Zealand financial services sector continues to grow and develop. Our liquidity risk management guidance released this year aims to ensure fund managers have adequate systems, controls and tools in place to manage liquidity against the full range of assets and business models. It is frustrating to hear this guidance being used as a justification for why firms are not investing in private or less liquid assets. Having appropriate systems and controls to manage liquidity enables investments in these types of assets. It means the frameworks and tools are in place to identify and manage the risk. Guidance raises awareness. It promotes discussion and endeavours to lift standards across the sector. We do not expect firms to simply leave this guidance to their legal and compliance departments. The audience for this guidance, and in fact any guidance that we publish, should be the senior leaders, the boards within your organisations, so that they can take a strategic view of what is needed. We're not looking for tick box compliance to our guidance. In fact, I read again our liquidity risk management guidance this morning before coming here. It's actually really difficult to take a tick box approach to doing it. Um, it is not a one size fits all piece of guidance. Our guidance is just that it is a guide to help inform how you work. And we are really looking forward to continuing our discussion、uh, on this guidance with the sector in the months ahead, including at an FSC hosted event next month. With so much focus on unnecessary regulatory burden, I do want to emphasise here that what's important is on the word unnecessary. We cannot and must not forget the crystallised harm or risk of harm, unprevented by market forces, that created the need for regulation in the first place. Let's just go back 12 years. The finance company collapses. And the risks and the harm exposed; these were risks and harm unmitigated by market forces, and they created a powerful argument for regulation to support mum and dad investors and quality financial markets in New Zealand. The FMA was created out of those ashes. The outcomes sought through the FMCA, the Financial Markets Conduct Act, remain current, and we are determined to champion them. But does it mean that we should always be alive to how we can deliver those outcomes better? Absolutely, and that is why we are leaning into taking an outcomes-focused approach to our work. We want to ensure that the FMA's work and our focus isn't just on compliance, but on what we're all actually trying to achieve. That's the ultimate way in which we will deliver well-focused regulation, keep costs down, and make sure that we are not unnecessarily cutting across innovation, cutting across growth. The industry response to our consultation on outcomes-focused regulation has shown us that we need to take the time to step back, take stock, and pause to consider the right way forward. One of the things that the FSC told us in its feedback was that they were worried that we were introducing new rules. To be clear, we are not setting out new rules. It's about primarily us,、uh, the FMA, ensuring that we remain a modern, forward-looking regulator and communicating what we believe that looks like. It is about our regulatory approach, and we do want to be very open with you about that. So we will have more to say in due course, but I hope that the philosophy of regulation that I set out, the set out at the beginning, that is very fresh to me today in this 40th anniversary、uh, time, gives you a flavour of how we intend to approach the role and the leadership that I want to bring to that. Enforcement. Uh, no doubt, you will have seen in the news some of the recent enforcement action that we have taken. That reflects months and often years of work from our teams, and I want to acknowledge their mahi. Enforcement is a bottom line for any regulator. It is ultimately the bare minimum that any regulator needs to do to ensure credibility, create a credible deterrent that encourages compliance. But enforcement is sometimes, rightly, 
characterized as the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Something has to have gone wrong, or be at a real risk of going badly wrong, uh, in the enforcement scenario. And ideally, the bulk of regulatory activity is focused on making sure that harm is prevented in the first place. A bit more of an ambulance at the top of a cliff. So it's in our supervision work that we mainly want to be experienced. Sometimes there'll be pointy elbows, but mainly collaboratively, educative, and engaged. And as we strive to be the best engagement-led regulator we can be, we know that building strong relationships with firms early can often mean that harm to consumers and investors is prevented in the first place. Strong regulator-firm relationships benefit all New Zealanders. As we and the industry have acknowledged in the past, this requires the FMA to be properly resourced. Our view remains the same as it has in recent years, that an engagement-led approach from a regulator uh, that reta that's retaining good staff, retaining good institutional knowledge, offers the right regulation for New Zealand. It delivers meaningful, proactive supervision, supporting firms and customers alike. So financial services reforms, I know that you're all going to be eagerly awaiting ministerial decisions on the financial services reform consultation from earlier this year. And uh, while I'm sure the minister will have more to say on this when he speaks to you this evening, I do want to give you a sense of where we're at from a practical perspective. The Commerce Commission and the FMA are working very closely on the transfer of credit functions with a number of joint activities underway. As part of this, you will start to see the FMA in some of the Commission's stakeholder engagement activities. Both of us, uh, both organisations, both regulators, are very committed to a seamless transfer of responsibilities and we're awaiting legislation to be passed by Parliament to give effect to this. Until then, uh, although you may see us in some of the stakeholder engagement activities, it's important to underline that the Commerce Commission is still the regulator for the triple CFA and lenders should still continue to engage with the Commission as normal. Turning to the new Kofi regime, we have been and are continuing to engage with firms ahead of the end of the licensing window in March next year. Firms should now have either made their license application or be in the final stages of seeking their board approvals prior to submitting their application. We know which firms are potentially behind where they want to be and need to be, and we've been reaching out to offer assistance and support as needed. This is the approach that the FMA has taken over several years through the introduction of several different regimes, and we know that it's one that uh, the entire industry support. Minister Bailey has signalled a priority of his is to streamline capital market settings to allow businesses greater access to capital to support productivity and growth. We're committed to working with the minister, MB, the industry, to explore how we might further better support uh, these markets to develop. A key focus for the minister is facilitating investment in private assets. A first step is industry engagement, and several roundtables took place last week. As work on this ministerial priority continues, I want to thank all of those who provided support already to help shape our, this work program. As a regulator, we know we have a role in ensuring markets work well for consumers and investors, while also enabling economic growth. There is a natural tension between encouraging competition, financial stability, ensuring consumers are sold products that deliver value and do what they say on the tin. And this tension is why the Council of Financial Regulators exists and why its work is so important. The FMA will be looking to see what it can do in the months ahead to respond to the Commerce Commission's report, particularly around the recommendation on transparency in mortgage advice. The Minister and the Commerce Commission have clearly expressed concerns about practices in this space. We will be looking to work with financial advice providers and firms across the mortgage spectrum to consider how to tackle this issue. 
And as the Kofi regime settles in from early next year, there will be opportunities for us to use our supervisory engagement with banks to look at the issues more broadly raised in the market study from this angle. So, in conclusion, as I turn back to this year's conference theme, a financial sector grounded in fairness is essential to consumer resilience. At the FMA, fairness isn't just a word to us, it's central to why we exist. That's why two months ago we released a research paper where we sought to understand what New Zealanders perceived as fair and unfair in the financial services they use. And ultimately, the research found that the majority of New Zealanders generally agree on what constitutes fairness in financial services. For example, in one scenario, 86% of respondents believed it was unfair that a bank took over a year to repay a client who had been, a client who had been overcharged fees. At the other end of the spectrum, 62% believed it was fair that one client's investment fund had lower fees than his mother's, because his fund manager spent less time researching markets and making changes to his investment. The release of this research has also seen the FMA hold roundtables with firms to discuss our findings. And this is the first time that we've adopted a roundtable approach to discussing findings, and it certainly will not be the last. Um, and we're looking at new, broader ways of engaging with the market to ensure that we meet our aims of being a really good engagement-led regulator. As the conduct regulator for New Zealand's financial markets, our vision is for more New Zealanders than ever to believe that the financial services sector is working well for them. And that's New Zealanders as providers as well as consumers. And while we play an important role in achieving this vision, we cannot do it alone. Our vision is closely aligned to that of the FSC itself, whose vision is to grow the financial confidence and well-being of New Zealanders. And I'm looking forward to working alongside you to continue to ensure that we foster a vibrant and trusted financial sector into the future. Thank you. Yeah, part of that speech was, was, was quite personal. Yeah. I don't want to say young, but can you take us back to younger yeah. Sam Barris and talk to us about how you, you kind of refined your thinking around the balance that regulators should strike? Yeah. So, um, look, 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 great question, because I was, uh, you know, I was 18, 19 at the time when I started, in 1984, you could work out my age from that, when I started studying um, economics. And, and I, I was very skeptical, uh, you know, or, or around regulation at the time. But what, as, as, as I grew older and kind of finished my economics degree and began to kind of, you know, go into, go into regulation, and it was kind of very focused on what is it that we need from regulation? Because it was quite clear as, you know, looking, I mentioned about the finance company collapses, that you observe when actually uh, the pursuit of profit, the sole pursuit of profit, isn't delivering what consumers need. It isn't consistent always with strong, vibrant financial markets. And so that meant that I, you know, first of all, began to see the case for regulation. But then always it was around, actually, we need to make sure that this regulation is needed, that it's delivering for consumers, that consumers have confidence in it. And it's also working as far as not unnecessarily cutting across in innovation. So that was, um, you know, that was a real drive. And it's still a, it's still a big driving, driving mm. force for me. I think what I've just seen over, you know, if I go back, you know, eight, you know, 58-year-old me is looking back at 18-year-old me and saying, look, uh, I know you thought regulation was terrible uh, back then, but ahead of you is financial market crises, mis-selling of products to consumers, uh, consumers not having confidence because they don't trust their providers, they don't trust their providers to deliver what's said on the tin. And so I, you know, my thinking on regulation you know, cha changed, as, changed as the facts changed. Yeah, yeah. What an extraordinary time to be studying economics, 1984. Um, for all of the nerds in the room, if you haven't already, I'm just going to go slightly off piste here and recommend the podcast Juggernaut. Oh, it's so if good. If you haven't heard it, yeah. It's really, really good. It's amazing. Yeah. It looks back at the history of that yeah. fourth Labour government and yeah. the fallout that followed. Yeah. Anyway, it's a, it, it's a top recommendation. So uh, the focus of this year's conference is consumer resilience yes. and prosperity. Can you talk to us a bit more about how you see the FMA's role there? Yeah, well, as I said, um, as I said in my speech, I think 
what's so exciting for us at the FMA is you think about what are the four things that matter in New Zealanders' lives uh, when it comes to their financial lives. It's their, you know, do they have a bank account? It's their banking relationships. It's can they take out loans to uh, smooth out their lifetime earnings? Uh, you know, whether it buy a house or buy a car, it's um, ensuring, you know, having access to insurance products that support you managing the risks that you don't feel able to manage on your own. And it's about investing and, uh, and being able to invest sort of for your, for your retirement. And, you know, we're looking at uh, implementation. Let's, let's look at COFI, uh, the um, Conduct of Financial Institutions, which looks uh, at the, um, you know, the, con you know the first proactive supervisory conduct regimes for banks and insurers. And this is going to provide the FMA with an opportunity to take a really strong engagement-led approach with the banking and insurance sector over such things that really matter to consumers, such as, um, you know, do I, you know, are my interests being properly taken into account? Does uh, this product that's being sold to me actually deliver what I reasonably expect it to deliver? Um, am I protected for undue um, sales pressure to buy products that actually I don't need and I don't have any confidence in? This is really exciting because it gives us an opportunity to uh, get into that in a way that uh, we, you know, that we haven't been able to, and I think has been really clearly needed in New Zealand. Uh, looking at investing, um, you know, the, the role that we can play to support Kiwis, um, you know, through really good regulation of the retail, um, the retail fund sector, particularly with KiwiSaver. So it's, um, I, I, you know, f for me coming here as uh, into New Zealand two and a half years ago with all of this uh, on the horizon, was just massively exciting. How, what, what is your assessment of KiwiSaver at the moment? So um, we, I know there's lots of debate, I'm sure someone might even want to ask a question, uh, I understand there's lots of debate around the policy settings and things for KiwiSafe. I want to be absolutely clear from our perspective, those are very much a point for the government. Our role is, um, is, is in regulating the market, but also using our role, and we're about to publish uh, the KiwiSaver Kiwi annual report, to really lean into encouraging New Zealanders to save for their retirement. I mean, we are concerned at the drop-off in, um, you know, some people are just not making uh, any contributions into their, in, into their KiwiSaver uh, at the moment, so we're really keen that that, that, that picks up. Um, so it's around, for us, it's around kind of providing a support of both as a regulator and, uh, and strongly encouraging uh, New Zealanders to invest for their, for, their, for their retirement. Very good. The government has said it's looking into action in terms of mortgage brokers following the Commerce Commission report, so how are you responding to that? So we've um, we are we've received a letter uh, for the, from the minister and discussions with the minister. He is uh, exhorting us to leave our uh, you know, to stretch all sinews to look at the issue of transparency in the in the mortgage advice sector. We are um, looking through that. Uh, we're looking we're looking at what we can do. Certainly, that combination, that coming together of uh, the implementation of the financial advice regime, uh, which was Mar you know which was March of last year, and the implementation of COFI March of next year gives us the proactive supervisory um, opportunities that we have. And what we will be wanting to do is to look at the issue of transparency, but work very, very closely with, with the industry. Um, and you know that, that this will be one where we will be looking to take a very strong engagement-led approach to this. Duval, uh, I know you are probably limited in what you can say. What, That's what, right. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> what, what can you say? Can you talk us through the FMA's thinking and the, the Deval case? Yeah, so um, I'm going to start by saying we don't provide running commentaries on investigations, and I think all of you will understand that that's actually quite a good thing. Um, so just what I can say is pretty much what's in the public domain. So a number of entities in the Deval group have been placed uh, into statutory management, this is the first time this has happened since the FMA was created, so it's extremely rare. It deals with, statutory management deals with complex corporate failures um, where you've got one or both of the following. The first is that uh, the company may have been off operating fraudulently or recklessly, uh, or where ordinary law, ordinary solvency law um, is incapable of dealing with uh, and securing an orderly wind down. 
The FMA considered that both um, were uh, relevant in this case, um, and we recommended statutory management to the minister. Um, and this was based both on our own investigation and a report from the court-appointed interim receiver. So as I said, our, um, that's pretty much all I can say. Um, our investigation is ongoing, and if people do have any questions, they should actually go to the um, PwC statutory manager. Very good. Uh, a question here from the floor. In your view, did the value for money work the FMA completed achieve its objective, or do you think you'd do it differently if you had a chance? Oh, that's a, um, got, yeah, so the value, so I'm going to start from the top. The value for money initiative uh, led to a very strong, some might say at times heated discussion um, over the issue of value for money. Uh, from our so I want to speak, you know, the outcome that we are looking for when we are talking about value for money uh, isn't a everything has to be the lowest possible fees. It's look, value for money at all. Um, value for money is that, and I kind of covered it in, in my speech, value for money is that the fees that you are paying reflect the value, that, the, the, the value of the work that's being done to, to, manage, your particular, to manage your particular fund. We, you know, one of the things that had led to our, um, our focus in this work was our observation that as funds were growing in scale, the, the benefits of, um, of, of that growth in scale were not being um, experienced in the fees that were being charged. And this was kind of one of our observations. Uh, but we, we, we are, you know, we're, we're very much kind of on BAU as far as kind of value for money at, at the moment. It's something that uh, we are very happy has, um, has created a focus on the value that investors are receiving um, from the charges that are, that, that are made. Um, the, yeah, so that's, yeah. We, 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 we're pretty happy. It's, it's not, uh, you know, I th I, we're not where we were two years ago when it was a huge, great big focus. We do feel that that engagement with the industry has worked really well. Actually, it's a good example of how uh, the FMA and the industry can, um, can engage in, as I say, you know, quite, you know, really meaningful ways, not necessarily agreeing with each other. Mm. Uh, but, but we, but the work that we do eventually, you know, creates benefit for, um, for investors. Yeah. Finally, earlier this year, you said you were going to look at pilot approaches on yeah. outcomes-focused regulation. So is that still the plan? Yeah, look, um, getting back to so the outcome-focused regulation, we were, um, we were overwhelmed by the number of people that said that they wanted to work with us to pilot the approaches. Um, your names have all been taken on the list. Uh, we, will be, um, we, we will be publishing uh, something probably now going into, uh, in, into early... Uh, into early 2025, 20, but what we're really doing is taking a look at the feedback that we got from that consultation because it, because it is about our regulatory approach and the concern that we had was that we hadn't necessarily communicated that well enough in the consultation that we set out last year. So there was big sort of an undue focus on is the FMA introducing new rules um, and we weren't, and what we're needing to do is think quite carefully about making sure that in the next step forward that we take on this, that it's very much around our regulatory approach and it's how we go about doing that. Uh, the people who stuck up, the firms that stuck up their hands to be pilots, will def we, we definitely want to work with you and we're very grateful for the enthusiasm and interest that was shown. Very good. Uh, it is an extremely busy time for you and the organisation, so we very much appreciate you giving us your time this morning. Please join me in thanking Sam Barris.